One of the perennial questions that even has come to the forefront in contemporary culture is how can you distinguish or differentiate between a perception and what you know? What level of certainty can you have about the world around you? Um, is it all just my experience, subjectively speaking, or is there something that's objectively there? Well, over the course of the history of science, there's been this way of looking at the world that helps us clarify that distinction about what we think we're perceiving before us and what's actually there. We basically call that the scientific method. And as a scientist myself, uh, having practiced uh, microbiology for a number of years before I entered the order, I'm fairly well versed in the scientific method and, and I love it and it's very useful. We can, for example, look at a dog or a wolf and we can find a variety of ways of knowing that it's a dog or it's a wolf. We can even get down to the genetic level and look at its DNA and say, well, it's this kind of dog that came from this part of the world 2,000 years ago. So we can know a lot and we can have a lot of information. But sometimes in life there are questions that we have or things that we want to know that can't necessarily be quantified or at least not quantified initially. So, does that mean we can't know anything about X, whatever X might happen to be? Our human experience tells us that that's not true. Think, for example, of love. How would we quantify the experience that we have as love? Does the lack of an ability to quantify it mean it's somehow not real because it can't be measured, it can't be known in that sense? I think we'd all disagree with that. We'd all say, well, I have this experience and I know it's a real experience, but I wouldn't know how to tell you to measure it. One of the reasons I'm fascinated with and spend a lot of time thinking about how we know is because in the ancient world, and then again uh, picked up in the scholastic world, and even again in the modern world, there are thoughts about other ways in which we can know. This so-called scientific way of knowing, the Greeks and the scholastics named speculative knowledge, where we can use our skills for reasoning to come to know things. But they also recognized this other way of knowing that they described variously, but used terms like connaturality knowledge through connaturality or affective knowledge, knowledge through the affect or the emotions. And this is what I'm most interested in and what I share some thoughts about uh, now with all those listening. <laughs> the way in which we can know that's not or different from the speculative way of knowing has to do with the experiences that I have, whether I'm before an object like a wolf or a subject, as such as another human being. All animals, according to this way of understanding the world, uh, have a level of knowing through connaturality. You can take the sheep, for example. The sheep sees a wolf in the distance. The sheep doesn't have the mental skills that we humans have, so it doesn't go through a reasoning process. But yet, in seeing the wolf, it somehow knows the wolf's not a good thing and does whatever it's able to do to get out of the way of the wolf. Um, it's that level of knowing that is at more of this uh, biological level that becomes the foundation for what eventually is described as affective or connatural knowledge. And the premise of this way of knowing is that it has to do with, if you will, fittingness. What's fitting for me? What's good for me? So the sheep in its own way is seeing the wolf and saying, mm, this is not good for me, and off the sheep goes. 
Um, I always like to use the example of chocolate to describe the distinction between speculative knowledge and connatural knowledge. Chocolate is one of my favorite things, and I am constantly drawn to chocolate when I see it, uh, because on some level, I think it's fitting for me to have chocolate. It's fitting for me to experience the chocolate. Um, I could describe for you a knowledge of chocolate that would talk about all of its physical chemical properties, that it originates from uh, the cacao bean of a tree, that it has a certain key ingredient called theobromine, and it has a certain viscosity and a melting temperature, and all of those kinds of very useful, very important, wonderful things about chocolate. And we would agree that, well, we now have a knowledge of chocolate. To which I would respond, ah, but do you know everything about chocolate? To which most of the time when I ask the question, people say, well, of course not. I haven't experienced, I haven't tasted the chocolate. Ah, that's an experience of knowledge through connaturality. Your knowledge of the chocolate comes from your experiencing the chocolate itself. And after you experience the chocolate, if you have a positive affective response to it, you on some level perceive, oh, this is a good for me. We talk about it in terms of like or dislike, uh, being drawn towards the thing that I like and being drawn away from the thing that I dislike. On some level, this fittedness, this fittingness for me as something that is good. It's with this idea in mind that the scholastics and the Greek philosophers sometimes would refer to this knowledge as knowledge through affectivity or knowledge through emotions because the knowledge is coming to me literally through my body. I'm having a bodily reaction to the thing or the person. And it's the kind of bodily reaction that I have that helps me understand, know that this is good for me or it's not good for me. And over time, we become more adept at recognizing what is or is not good for me. And it's all happening, we might say, at a subconscious or a pre-conscious level. We're not mentally thinking each of these steps as we move along. It just happens. And we know what we like, and we know what we don't like. But the point is that this is a real level of knowledge. And one of the uh, challenges of uh, the scientific revolution and the post-Cartesian world is that this kind of way of knowing was downplayed, if not actually dismissed, so that unless things can be measured in one way or another, unless things can be quantified and verified by independent observation and similar mathematical results, it's somehow not real or somehow not completely known. But this is not our experience. Our experience is much richer and much deeper. In particular for human beings, knowledge through connaturality or affective knowledge becomes critical because we are rational creatures. And unlike lower animals such as a sheep or a dog, we can use our reason to augment the knowledge that we are gaining through our emotions, through our affect. And this is how we come to engage reason and will and build up, as it were, this very fundamental way of knowing. In that sense, the usefulness for human beings of connatural knowledge or knowledge through emotion is that this kind of knowledge helps us understand two ways in which we interact with the world. What we're going to do in the world or what we're going to make in the world. When we consider what we want to do in life, what we want to do in the world, through the lens of connaturality, we're actually speaking about moral behavior, doing what we consider, whatever our values are, that which is good. And the knowledge through connaturality gives us insight into that which is good because we are drawn to that which is good. We, on some level, perceive through our emotions, this behavior is good for me. When we're speaking about certain kinds of behavior, we can see, a, again, as with chocolate, a distinction between speculative knowledge and connatural knowledge. Let's take, for example, justice. 
Here at the Dominican School of Philosophy and Theology, we spend a lot of time learning about justice. And we look through different perspectives, different lenses, different historical experiences of what is the just act. And hopefully, by the time students are finished here, they have a lot of working knowledge, we might say, about just behavior. They know all the rules, so to speak, of just behavior. But the question which follows up on that is, okay, so you have a lot of speculative knowledge about justice. Have you ever acted with justice? Does your life exhibit just behavior? There can be a world of difference between a speculative knowledge of justice, knowing all the rules and regulations, and a connatural knowledge of justice, where one's life exhibits behaviors which demonstrate that you know the rules, that you know the principles. And even more profoundly, one need not have the speculative knowledge of justice to be just. This is one of the key distinctions that comes forth in scholastic philosophy and theology, that in all of the moral virtues, one can live a very virtuous life, but as it were, have none of the vocabulary that connects or defines all of those behaviors. It's for this reason that St. Thomas Aquinas felt that knowledge through connaturality or affective knowledge was of greater virtue than speculative knowledge. So not to dismiss speculative knowledge or to say it's not useful, but to say it's not as valuable, if you will, to the human person as connatural knowledge. Why? Because knowledge through connaturality changes us. It transforms our behavior. It makes us new and, we hope, better people. Great to know all of the technical language around justice, but more important to learn how to live with justice, how to be just in life. And this is one of the key defining differences of connaturality and why I feel it's so important to recover as a way of knowing in our contemporary culture. With this distinction about connatural and speculative knowledge insofar as one's behavior, I can, for example, have different levels of how I think about chocolate. I can think of my love for chocolate and how I'm drawn to consume chocolate. And if I were a lower animal, I might consume chocolate to the point of making myself ill. But because I have this capacity for reason, I can recognize that, well, in theory, I could eat as much chocolate as I want for as long as I want, but then I'm going to get sick. And I recognize there's a hierarchical ordering of value here, a hierarchical ordering of goods. So I do value the chocolate, but I happen to value at this moment in life my own health more. So I'm not going to be gluttonous. I'm only going to eat the chocolate to a certain level and then I'm going to stop. But because of the role of will in this thought process, in this reasoning process about a hierarchical ordering of values, I can go even one step further. I can say, you know, I like chocolate and I like chocolate even in moderation, but being Catholic, it's Lent, I'm going to forgo chocolate. And I can use my will to, as it were, override some of these other goods because I have a greater good. Or I could say to this person sitting across from me, I know this is my last piece of chocolate and I would really want to have it, but why don't you take it? And I engage in altruistic behavior. Again, a hierarchical ordering of those things which are good for me, because on some level I recognize being good to you is a greater good for me than actually consuming the chocolate. 